the presentation. This time right here, you'll, you'll go up and have, you'll have a lot of help. So we have three years. <laughs> get started shortly. We're just waiting for Jason to come back into the room. But in the meantime, test your microphones and make sure they're all working properly. Jim, Jim. Okay, good, right, thank you. Good, uh, 10 minutes each, um, and again, we're gonna be pretty strict on that, so Jim. on May 11th at the technical presentations. And what I'd like to do today is 
do two things. One is to give my response to the opponent's demonstrations of their technical alternatives to circumvention. And then I'd like to do a short recap of my May 11th testimony to clear up some misunderstandings. Um, the opponents demonstrated two alternatives that have been suggested as an alternative to circumvention. One is screen capture software using replay video capture, and the other is smartphone video scan conversion. Screen capture software allows a computer to play back protected media and then actually record what is on the screen into a file that can be used. Um, we tried this um, technique as well, and what I observed of screen capture software were the same issues that we observed when we did the test. Um, we noticed an extreme problem with stuttering images due to dropped frames. It's very computer intensive to try to record live 30 frame a second video into a file and have audio all at once. And when you have sections of the video that have a lot of rapid motion, or you attempt to capture them at a higher resolution than DVD by filling the computer screen with them, drop frames occur and they can never be replaced because they were never recorded. There was no software that can actually replace them. And this is not acceptable for public television broadcast. Um, there are audio <coughs> synchronization issues because the audio lags behind the picture. And more serious is that because a vast majority of documentary filmmakers use Macintosh computers for editing and producing their programs, the latest Mac computers do not allow any screen capture software at all when playing back a DVD or any iTunes media, whether it's video or screen or download. So it's really not a workaround that we can work with. The other <coughs> technique was something we call smartphone video screen capture. And it's exactly what it sounds. You take a smartphone, use the video portion of it, aim it at a monitor that's playing back a protective media disc, and literally photograph the monitor. Well, this introduces, again, unacceptable problems. Um, smartphones have automatic exposure and automatic focus that are constantly searching every time there's a change in the, the video um, settings, it, it jumps out at you. Um, the audio is only from the camera microphone, so anything else that's in the room, you, you have to essentially play it back on the speakers of the TV set and pick it up with the microphone. But the most serious is something called video aliasing which occurs when you have very fine detail dots on a computer screen or monitor and very fine dots on an image sensor in your iPhone. And when they don't line up exactly right, you get artifacts at the overlap point. And these artifacts show up on top of people's faces, they show up on buildings with fine detail. Um, and this is specifically forbidden in the latest public television um, uh, technical specifications that came out in March. The image must be free of compression artifacts and aliasing, such as the artifacts associated with scan conversion. So again, it doesn't work for us. So I tried to come up with some alternatives to this, explore them, and I presented two possible um, <coughs> options that I considered. Alas, neither of them are successful, and I'll tell you why. The first one was to take an analog output from a DVD <coughs> player or a Blu-ray player and up-convert it to high definition using a sophisticated, expensive box called the Terranex. As you can see, it's a little bit intimidating, even to an engineer like myself, with multiple buttons and connections, and even two power cords are required uh, to, to fire this thing up. And manual is 249 pages and there's 24 pages of just telling you what different colors each of the buttons on the front panel might be and what that means. It's not something for the faint of heart. And here's just one example of one menu. This is the menu that is used to adjust the aspect ratio of your signal coming in because some of the older DVDs, the aspect ratio is 4 by 3, High definition has to be 16 by 9, so you need to convert that. But it's so labor intensive and confusing that it's impractical. But there's a more serious problem. 
since it requires an analog input, we have two choices. We have the component analog signals that are the better of the two analog signals coming out of DVD and Blu-ray players. And we have the composite signal, which is a much less, uh, much lower quality signal where all the colors are smooshed together and you get all sorts of interaction between the color and the luminance part of the picture. Well, here is an example of a Blu-ray player from <coughs> late last year, December 2011. And you can see that it has component analog outputs on the top row, red, blue, and green. And on the lower right, you have the composite output. Here is the same mid-level model Panasonic that was released early this year. Component output's gone. And the latest version of this Panasonic Blu-ray player, there's no analog output at all. So without an analog source from a protected disc, the Terranex is worthless because we can't get a signal into it. So another method I explored was to essentially say, okay, what's the problem, we've already stated the problem with software <coughs> image capture. So let's investigate hardware image capture. Um, a matrix box was selected as a test, and the way it works is you play back your protected media on the computer, you take the monitor output from the computer tower, loop it through this box, which extracts that signal, and turns it into a recordable video signal. You'll notice that there's no audio associated with this system. Audio is a whole separate signal path, and it requires an audio delay box because the time it takes to process that video signal, if you don't delay the audio, everything will be out of sync. But there are problems with this as well. It's also costly and complex to operate. It requires a high-end computer tower and graphics card, and it will not work with Blu-ray because Blu-ray HDCP on the graphics cards blocks any high-definition output. And it blocks the use of hardware scan conversion because you're putting this box in between the computer and the monitor. And once you do that, the high-definition signal stops. It, at Kartemkin Films last year, we produced a 90-minute um, American Masters show called The Good Man, and we were able to take advantage of our current exemption to pull numerous clips from DVD without ever going through an analog path. And that worked for us back in 2011. And now we're being asked by public television to produce everything in high definition, to release everything in high definition to them. That's all they will accept. And they put a severe limit on any kind of standard definition clips being up by analog, which as I've mentioned, is fading away, um, and also the problems I've mentioned with hardware screen capture. So in summary, both of the alternatives proposed by the opponents will not work for public television and broadcast specifications. <coughs> we would be rejected. We wouldn't be able to use the clips. Hardware up conversion and hardware scan conversion are very costly. They require an engineer to operate. You can find one that knows how to do it. <coughs> they degrade the image because when you up convert a signal from a standard def source, you're creating quasi high definition. You're creating image detail out of nothing by duplicating lines and interpolating lines. It's a mathematical trick. It's not HD. It may have the same number of lines of resolution as HD, but it's coming from a bad, a mediocre source. Um, and of course, analog is disappearing from all of our sources, our, our disc playback sources. And PBS severely limits it even when we do have it. I get calls from filmmakers all the time asking me, how, how can I deal with this? How can I get my archival material into my show? And when I explain these options and some of the problems that exist, they realize that they don't have the financial resources or the technical resources to even try to use them. And so if 
because of the existence of this equipment that doesn't even satisfy our needs, is going to prevent 95% of the rest of the filmmakers from gaining access to protected media that's going to be of a quality enough to broadcast, um, then it's a real shame. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, I should have mentioned this this morning, but all those people who are bringing PowerPoints for any other audiovisual aids, you will be leaving copies with us, I assume, in our record. Absolutely. Good, good. And also, I did misspeak when I said which classes we were talking about. I was reading from the wrong page, so I hope no one will object if we just correct the transcript so that when anyone gets to that point in the transcript, they're not hopelessly confused. So when I started this session, what I should have said, and what I hope we can correct in the transcript, is that this particular panel is to discuss 7D and 7E. Any objections? <laughs> Thank you very much. Your exemption is great. <laughs> So we're, we're ready for me? Yes, please. Um, I'm Gordon Quinn. I hate I, to tell you, but you drew the bad seat. you got to press that darn button all the time. Oh, Unless okay. Peter might be able to share you. Oops, I think his is OK. Oh, yeah, mine goes out. Yeah, I see. OK, thanks. Okay, that's better, because yeah, I have to do that. Great. OK, so uh, I'm Gordon Quinn. I've been making documentary films for 46 years. I'm the founder and artistic director <coughs> of our template films. <coughs> Uh, and we are a fairly robust institution, a not-for-profit, who produces for PBS, NBC, uh, theatrical uh, presentation is very important to us, uh, and other cable outlets that, we, that we've been on. And they all have very technical specifications. Um, we are rights holders, and we are also rights users. Uh, we are unusual in that we do have a technical director, Jim, who has an engineering background. And so we consider ourselves a resource for the larger community. And when Jim talks about he uh, gets calls all the time from people with, in this particular area, but we get calls in a range of areas, and we see that part of our mission is to help people uh, exercise their fair use rights. We're sinking this exemption uh, to continue the fair use uh, that we reclaimed with the publication of the documentary filmmaker's statement of best practice in fair use. Um, it's a narrow and a defined fair use exemption. Uh, 18 years ago, when Hoop Dreams was released, we licensed what we should have been able to claim fair use on. But at that time, we had lost that fair use, not because of so much court decisions, but because of big players intimidating the, uh, the broadcasters and insurance companies and other gatekeepers. But we've now won those rights back, and it's terribly important for our work. The Interrupters, which was just on Frontline, um, had many fair use clips in it, uh, as did A Good Man, which Jim reported to, which was on American Masters. We are really asking to be able to continue the status quo and merely updating what we've had for the past few years to uh, updating the exemption to be able to deal with the new technical standards that are coming from, uh, that are already here actually, they've arrived from uh, broadcasters and the theatrical presenters. Um, any solution that involves licensing, <coughs> managing copies, streaming, anything that involves us having to go and ask permission from the people that we may be critiquing, parroting, uh, using a clip to make an argument about, trying to show something about what's happening in the society, any of that is unacceptable for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, we're exercising a right, and that's, we learn that in our struggle in reclaiming the fair use, how important it is to us to have this right and to be able to uh, use it. Um, I should have said up front, by the way, that I'm here speaking for documentary filmmakers in general, uh, the class, and for the Independent Documentary Association. Um, and just a couple more points. Um, let me give you two examples of how important 
having quality that is close to the original, how important it is. In A Good Man, in the film that I just directed about the dancer Bill T. Jones, there is a scene where he is talking and he's saying, you know, and it's over clip that we fair use. And he's saying, and he's, he's dancing and he's, you know, he's bare to the waist. And he's talking about, you know, I became very aware that I was a black body being viewed by white bodies. And you can see the muscles rippling on his body underneath his skin. You can see the sweat on his body. The lighting is spectacular. And you can see every detail of this body that he's talking about. He goes on and says a little bit more about this point and what it means to be this kind of an artist in a culture like that. And I need that quality in an image like that to get that across. There's another project that we're in conversations with now about uh, a major film critic of theatrical films, uh, one of the most important film critics in America today. And I can foresee in making that film how important it's going to be. This is a critic who constantly makes the point that people should be seeing films in theaters uh, on the big screen. That, that experience is very important here. So it, when we make our film about him, we need to be able to be, when he's talking about the sensual and subtle qualities of an image that he may be critiquing in some kind of way or helping the audience to understand how to perceive that image. Um, we need to do something that approximates. It doesn't have to be, you know, but it, it has to really be a high quality image. And of course, we have to meet the technical standards of PBS and as I would hope for this film, also the theatrical uh, presentations. Um, I'm also aware that there are films now that are coming out, new films, that are only going to be related, released on Blu-ray. That's going to be the only way we'll be able to get them, or in some encrypted streaming kind of way. And so it's important, obviously, in this film that we be able to get that. And we see this as not only, uh, you know, I mean, this is going to be benefit to everyone who loves movies to have this guy be able to take an audience inside his work and understand what it is that people can actually see in movies to, to help people have a real media literacy uh, to be able to read what's happening in the new technology. Um, something that I think is pretty significant is that we've had this exemption for three years. There has been no abuse. There have been no documentary filmmakers. There's no situation in which documentary filmmakers have broken the encryption where they have been using the exemption to exercise their legal fair use rights that has led to any kind of abuse. And I think that will continue in the future. We are, you know, rights holders, as I said, and we care about piracy too, you know? We're not trying to do anything that enables people to, to steal anything. What we're trying to do is do our work, make our points, uh, critique things, criticize them, and in conclusion, uh, I just want to say that it's <clears throat> in a democracy, we need to be able to comment, to critique, to put into context all of the culture that exists out there. Nothing can be, you know, you can't be, well, this isn't safe, you can use this and you can critique this, but you can't critique something else. It all has to be available to us within the narrow limits set out in the documentary filmmaker statement. We're only talking about fair use, but it's a right. We have to be able to point at it, to say this is what it's like. And we live now in a digital age. We live in an age where the quality of the image is more and more <coughs> important. And we have to be able to come close to that quality in what we're critiquing or to duplicate it. Uh, we should, fair use should not be locked out, uh, not by technology and not by so that's really uh, my presentation. Okay, thanks very much. Peter. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, good morning, West Coast time. Um, <laughs> not too bad. But anyway, um, so the work that I do is um, currently focused primarily on uh, transformations in publishing, and I'm here to talk about multimedia and ebooks. I'm currently the director of the Book Server Project at the Internet Archive, and I also run a fairly well-known conference called Books and Browsers with O'Reilly Media and with some major support from Safari Books Online. 
I'm also a contributing editor and blogger at Publishers Weekly, where I cover libraries, intellectual property issues, and media. And I'm an ex-board member of the International Digital Publishing Forum, which is the standards body for ebook standards, and is responsible for the EPUB format, which has recently been updated to the EPUB 3 format to accommodate greater interactivity and stronger support for HTML5. I'm here to talk about three things shortly. Um, first is just rapid advances in ebook authoring uh, tools and software, making it possible for people, for authors, to create multimedia books for the first time with relatively little technical expertise. Second, a DMCA exemption is necessary for authors to create these works because alternatives which would require financial resources that most authors do not have or, and increasingly the case, result in a deterioration of video quality which consumers and distributors would find unacceptable. And third, alternatives to circumvention are inadequate in part because of rapid advances in video standards and displays, particularly for mobile display uh, devices like the recent iPad Retina, which are compelling content distributors to produce content really beyond even HD video quality um, and high quality audio content as well. So first let me briefly talk about multimedia ebook technology and development. For the first few years of the ebook explosion, what we've had are mostly translations of analog or print books into digital formats. But a couple years into that transition, authors are now beginning to explore what they can do with digital books that were beyond them in terms of what they could do with print. And this has been aided by an increasing integration of ebook standards into web standards. So, for example, IDPF, the standards body for ebooks, is now actually coordinating development of EPUB 3 and successors with the W3C and HTML5 standards to support interactivity, high quality video, audio, and other advanced features. An example of this, or an instance of this, is an EPUB project or an IDTF project called Readium, which seeks to embed the ability to render or digest EPUB files directly in a browser for the first time without any additional software necessary. New authoring systems are beginning to emerge that take advantage of these affordances on the web. And these tools enable drag and drop authoring of multimedia content um, that we've never seen before. And they also provide support for what we call push to publish. Let me give you a couple of quick examples of these. One, a uh, San Francisco startup called Airbook just released a tool today called Airbook Maker, uh, which is drag and drop of media uh, into a web browser um, template, and again, push to publish output. An indication of the importance of video, the uh, filmmaker Cody Chubb is a principal of this company and is very much engaged in uh, assisting the uh, integration of video content. Uh, Airbook Maker has been demonstrated in Sixth Avenue in New York and a major online retailer in the Northwest uh, with great interest in all occasions. The book, another startup in San Francisco, initiated with video ebooks, but pivoted realizing that their platform for ebook creation was more vital and more, um, uh, more important and is making that available to authors and small publishers. And then finally, Apple's iBooks author. Um, a, a tool in the hands of millions and growing, uh, which enables uh, sophisticated multimedia ebook authoring um, and a push to publish into the iBook store. It's also important to note that Mozilla, uh, the well known browser company, is releasing probably around November 1st a tool called Popcorn Maker. Popcorn is a new video framework which, for the first time, will enable the embedding of external web resources or interactive links within video content. This will enable highly interactive video content for the very first time, and ebook manufacturers like Airbook are already integrating popcorn into their toolkit. It's, um, both the Internet Archive, my organization, and Wikimedia are providing support to Mozilla to integrate this content into, um, into uh, uh, their tool set. So I'm going to also then talk about why um, why why DMCA exemption is required, um, and what are 
some of the other forces pushing on advances here. A DMC exemption is necessary to prevent a substantial adverse impact on multimedia authoring. Any author that's seeking to use multimedia content today is going to first look in large online archival repositories like the Packard Collection or the Internet Archive, among others. But online collections are very spotty and fragmentary. And as a consequence, most ebook authors are going to have to resort to secured physical media like DVDs and increasingly Blu-ray. Licensing is not a strong alternative um, because content is rarely available in fragments almost always is available in its entirety. Um, and this is very similar to the problem that we saw in the Georgia State case uh, involving CCC recently. Um, additionally, fees and terms are structured for commercial use from one commercial party to another commercial party and none not tend, do not tend to be geared toward individual authors or creators seeking educational or entertainment products. Finally, I want to talk about technical advances which are really pushing the bar dramatically in terms of video quality expectations. For the many years in Silicon Valley, we've gone through stages of, of focus on first memory, um, higher quantities of memory storage, then on more and more sophisticated processing. But today, the focus right now is on display. And we can see that with the iPad Retina. Already newer mobile displays are coming out, being marketed by LG and other companies with higher resolution. And what we're seeing come now into manufacturing are that level of screen at a far reduced cost, as well as newer generation screens that um, are embedded in plastic and are therefore wearable or wrappable <coughs> and curvable. These are display technologies that are, as I said, coming into manufacturing. These are not lab only screens at this point, this will be fairly dominant in a couple of years, or very prevalent in a couple of years. Finally, we see this echoed as well in video standards. For several years, there was contention among browser manufacturers over what video standard would be utilized to embed video in browsers and ebooks. And just this spring, video, or I'm sorry, browser manufacturers coalesced around a common standard, H.264. So all of the browser manufacturers, Mozilla, Google, Microsoft, Apple, are now endorsing H.264, which supports high quality HD video. And next year, we'll see the release of the successor of H.264, understandably enough, H.265. And H.265 is being prepared in concert with this growing innovation in displays. 265 will actually support what are called 8K displays or ultra HD TV <coughs> displays. So already we're seeing the, the march of quality content moving extremely rapidly beyond the level of DVD. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to let you know that for Bob Best presentation, we're just going to turn down the lights because there's some audio visual and we'll make sure to turn it back on right after the presentation.
Thank you. You can go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. I'm Babette Buster. I've been, since 1992, an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California's Graduate School of Cinematic Arts in the Peter Stark Producing Program. I've also been on the guest faculty of La Famise in Paris, the University of Milan, and I've lectured in film and business programs all over Europe, Japan, and South America. Since 2000, I've also been on the guest faculty of Pixar for the last 12 years, and the last two years I've been developing a specific program for Disney animators, Sony Animation, and uh, I've developed a, an extensive program about the history of uh, Hollywood economics for 20th Century Fox. Basically, I just want to get into what I do, and that has to do with technological wonder. you actually wonder. speak into the mic? Okay. Sorry. So all, <laughs> in the beginning, it all had to do with technological wonder. When Thomas Edison created the first films, but he saw them like light bulbs. And it took 25 years before D.W. Griffith understood that it was storytelling combined with technology. And that was the shot heard around the world, and that's the beginning of the industry the U.S. now dominates worldwide since that time. These are all the advances in technology that have, uh, visionary filmmakers have taken to the next level in storytelling. So this is what I teach. How do you take any idea with current innovations in technology and do what visionary filmmakers have learned to do progressively in our business. I'd like to just discuss one of the leading concepts that I do. I'm gonna take six and a half minutes just to show you some of these concepts. Now let's all remember our Hegel from philosophy class. Actually, it was D.W. Griffith who first understood this. It's the principle of editing, and he got this from Charles Dickens. Basically, how do you create a big idea? You combine two colliding ideas, and that's what we call juxtaposition. So, in 1972, Francis Ford Coppola in The Godfather decided to do the following. This little girl in white crosses over past Marzini. He's the uber villain of The Godfather. What we're doing here is setting up a DNA in the story that every time you see a mafioso, you're going to see an innocent child. The question being, how far would you go to protect your family? In this world, you go as far as murder. Notice Tom Hagen right here, the consigliere. He will be surrounded by two little girls, and a pregnant woman will come into the shot because he's always there at the inception of the murder's idea. The, the camera pans directly over to Luca Brazzi. Notice the little girl in white. He is the man who's the hitman. This is a very deliberate choice in every single scene and sequence. Notice in the next moment, Luca Brazzi will thank Vito for having been invited to his daughter's wedding. And he will pledge. Well, you won't see that, but he pledged his undying loyalty. And at that moment, children scattered into the room all around him, showing the visual that Luca Brazzi has done many uh, instances of murder for the Godfather. And finally, in the climax of the movie, the priest asks this of Michael as he's standing Godfather his sister's baby, and then we see that he's also wrought a baptism of blood and the, by killing the heads of all five families in uh, New York City. And the priest says, will you go in peace? And indeed he will, because now he's the uber godfather. How far has he gone to protect his family? He's gone as far as to damn himself to hell in the middle of the Catholic Church, consciously in a ceremony. So the next instance I want to show you was a turning point in Pixar's history. John Lasseter had given the Toy Story 2 to another director. When he saw it, he was devastated. He said it had no heart. He took it back, and Ed Catmull said in the Harvard Business Review that it was this scene, of which we're only gonna see a minute out of four and a half minutes, that was a turning point in Pixar's history. Notice the reflection of Jessie. She has been thrown under the bed by her child. And it turns out, she will have been there perhaps 10 or 15 years. Notice the dust. And as the pink is taken out from under her, we turn to a world of autumn colors. There's even dust on her hat. And what we're learning here, as Bruno Bettelheim said in The Uses of Enchantment, is that fairy tales very necessarily psychologically prepare children for life's inevitable tragedies. 
in this sequence, the music is so sad, it's in direct contrast to the rest of the film, which is, which is in blues and yellows and upbeat and fun. And what Jesse learns is what we all have to learn, that someday someone we love will throw us away. Our hearts will be broken. We will be thrown into a nursing home. We will be abandoned. This is extremely important to the power of the entire film. And once they understood this, Ed Catmull said, it transformed Pixar's history, and they now have the greatest track record of blockbusters in history. But they forget you. And this is Woody's journey. At the very end of the film, he has to say, to, he's standing on the threshold of a, of a window, looking out at Andy, knowing he's going to grow up and go away to college. And Buzz says, well, what do you think about that? And he says, I'm going to cherish every day as long as it lasts. I'm going to love anyway. Such is the power of cinematic storytelling. And finally, I'd like to talk about a concept called the power of rhymes. This is extremely important in cinema storytelling. And Steven Spielberg's true tour de force film, Schindler's List, we have the concept of what is the power of industrialization. Notice, this is a master shot, all in one sequence. As the camera dollies in and out, the lighting, Cartier-Bresson-like lighting, high key, whites and darks. Notice we can see the steam coming out of us, and we are watching in real time as a pot is made, and it's astonishing. It's wonderful, isn't it? And we are on the same wavelength as this man here, who is, who would have had a destiny going to Auschwitz. But Schindler hired him just to bring him into his, as because he was cheaper to be in the factory. Now this last shot we just saw, that's eight seconds long. That is the fulcrum of the story. It proves that Schindler is going to be a huge success. He's got millions of pots in the hand. He's gonna make a lot of money with the SS. And guess what? It shows the volume of industrialization. And then in our final shot here, this is the shot we call the rule of threes that leads us to the emotional horror of Schindler's List. Because guess who else had this idea of industrialization? Hitler. And so in a rhyming shot of dollying, going in and out, very painstakingly, with the same lighting grayscale, we see how deliberate and intentional the process was for Hitler and the SS to eliminate an entire six million race of people. It's volume, industrialization. And what happens in cinema is all about the orchestration of emotions. What you want to do is take people from the opposite emotion first, which in this case was delight and wonder. And now, as we're facing this and taking it in, we are waking up and going, oh my god. And what we are on is the same wavelength as the jewelry appraisers we are about to meet. And I want you to notice, they're all wearing the gold um, Star of David. They're Jewish men working for the SS. And finally, one man wakes up. We are on his wavelength. We are waking up to the horror of industrialization. And in this scene, which is classic Spielberg scene, he makes it very clear now, this is 50 minutes into the story, what this film is about. And finally, it climaxes because cinema is the art form of transformation in this. I saw a documentary shortly after World War II in which an SS officer said very matter-of-factly, you know, that the job of killing millions of people is a messy business. And the big problem is management because the men on the front line go crazy. So it's a man management issue. We need to separate them from the problem, hence the gas ovens, so they're very matter of fact. So what we need to do is, in the madness of this situation, you start asking, what have I done? It's overwhelming. And in this case, listen to this line of dialogue. Party, Auschwitz, in one sentence. That's juxtaposition, and that's horrifying. What could one person do? And so what Spielberg does, what he's foreshadowed, is he shows a little girl with a red coat. And she's now dead. We had seen her once before alive. She is Schindler's conscience. And at this moment, he wakes up. 
In this scene, we go from madness to enlightenment, and that's what cinema does best. Now, I seek to make an ebook of my course because it's all about technological wonder. This is all I've been able to do right now because I've appealed to the studios and I have been rebuffed at every turn. First of all, they don't really do business. They don't return emails or phone calls. And once they do, they'll give me a very high price or they will say I have to reach all the descendants who were ever in the scene, including the musicians. I even got a hostile cease and desist letter from one attorney. And what I would like to do is an e-book like this. Look at this. 10 minutes into Toy Story 2, we see Woody challenge Buster, the dog, to reach for the sky. He then gives Buster a belly rub and says, who's going to miss me when I'm gone? Okay, this boy. is the theme of the it's entire really film skill. foreshadowing Woody's gotcha. journey. I am appealing oh, for exemptions to the DVD, oh, to be able to use DVDs for my life story. And finally, what I'd like to say is, I've tried to do this with only 200 people a year worldwide in the ivory tower. I would like to now re uh, be able to broadcast this in an e-book to those thousands or millions who would like access to this material, which you can only get through the process of mentoring and education. We can only wonder what the technological wonders and the storytelling they would discover then. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Alex Cohen. Um, I'm here again on behalf of documentary filmmakers, fictional filmmakers, and uh, ebook authors to clarify a few points along with my colleague Brendan Charney that have been made or discussed over the last few weeks in the hearings. First, there really should be no question that documentary filmmakers, fictional filmmakers, and ebook authors clearly make fair use. Everyone agrees on this, and there's a really good reason for that. All three of these groups are supervised and, in a sense, regulated by very conservative gatekeepers, the errors and insurance companies that ensure that any form of fair use that actually is going to be inserted into these films or ebooks is clearly fair use and has been re reviewed and opined on by an attorney who has experience doing that. Not to mention the fact that the filmmaking community has a statement of best practices that deals with fair use and that they are rights holders in their own regard and therefore are also very concerned with <coughs> abiding within the law and being uh, true to the meaning and intent of fair use. In addition, just wanted to quickly clarify, uh, in case it's unclear, for the ebook exemption, we are only asking for DVD and digitally transmitted video. And even though, as Peter stated, the capability of ebooks is actually at or above Blu-ray HD, that is not what we're asking for because we're only asking for what we consider the, the bare minimum to ensure the ability for ebook authors uh, to make effective fair use. And that leads into the next point, which is that the fair use that has been discussed and as Bobat has shown, requires the ability to make nuanced and detailed analysis. And as Bob Bett did so better than I could have ever done, when you see, when you need to see the dust on the floor, when you need to see the reflection on the wood, or when you need to see the splattering of water in the Schindler's List scene, that's just not possible uh, unless you have an exemption. It's just not possible with any of the alternatives that have been discussed. And that it's not possible because as Jim discussed, no alternative is sufficient because, every, because these alternatives are too expensive, they're too complicated, and they will not satisfy critical technical standards that are set by distributors and broadcasters. In particular, I just want to make a quick point. We've discussed a lot, uh, or had a lot of discussion about hardware scan conversion uh, and up conversion. Uh, and Jim, I think Jim's a very modest person. Um, just want to really make, make it clear that Jim is in the top of his field, and he has more than 40 years' experience working with film, with technologies, and things that could be called uh, proposed alternatives. And that there are, there's almost no one else in the US who knows what Jim can do, or, or even has a Jim involved, or, or would even know how to do the work that Jim does. And as Jim stated very, very well, um, film, you know, filmmakers call him because they don't know what they're doing. And that's actually the reality of the majority of filmmakers in the US. They don't have technical directors, and they don't have access to the knowledge, expertise, or financial wherewithal to even use these exemptions. Um, and as a result, if an exemption is not granted, the, re 
what would happen would be only a handful of filmmakers would ever would be able to make fair use. And they wouldn't even necessarily be able to make fair use. They would be able to attempt to make fair use and try to use things that for all the reasons that Jim talked about frequently do not meet these critical broadcast standards. And as a result, nearly all filmmakers and even probably even more ebook authors would not be able to make fair use. They would be foreclosed from that. Um, finally, for my portion of, of this testimony, I just want to make two very small points about um, things that were said at prior hearings. The first is, on May 11th, uh, Jim briefly mentioned um, the use of upconversion uh, with regards to CNN. We would just like to clarify that CNN is a broadcaster in its own regard and does not necessarily have to meet the stringent um, technical and distribution standards that a third party like Kertempkin would have to in order to get distributed on a PBS or in theaters. And as Jim talked about very, you know, very proficiently, upconversion has many, many issues and the sources that allow upconversion are rapidly disappearing. Um, on a second point, you may remember on May 17th, uh, Mr. Lawrence Brush, who spoke on behalf of fictional filmmakers, talked about sending out a clip uh, for upconversion in order to get a film in a film festival. We also wish to clarify that the technical standards for film festivals and for ultimate distribution and broadcast are completely different and the latter being the, the true requirements for distribution and broadcast that are critical to filmmakers like Gordon and all of his colleagues are extremely stringent, and they have very strong restrictions with respect to upconversion and all the other alternatives that have been discussed over the last few months. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Brendan Charney. Thank you very much. The opponents have made uh, a lot of screen capture but it's unclear if it even qualifies as an alternative. Even if rights holders in this room can see, uh, <clears throat> even if rights holders in this room state that screen capture doesn't violate the DMCA, that doesn't prevent other rights holders or other people who might bring claims. Filmmakers and authors can't rely on screen capture because screen capture is a broad term that encompasses many software products. And these software products involve digital methods that operate within the black box of a program that a user can't scrutinize or understand. These programs can be easily updated without a user understanding how they've been updated. That means that if the Copyright Office were to uh, deny an exemption based on the idea that screen capture could be an alternative, we would see a situation in which filmmakers would look at this black box product, not know whether or not it would violate the DMCA, and in the face of the risk that this uncertainty creates, many would fear that the crushing liability and, and sanctions that the DMCA violation brings just aren't worth making fair use in a particular instance. When that's aggregated across the entire filmmaking community, we would see a lot of fair uses not being made, and that's exactly the sort of harm to fair use that this uh, rulemaking is designed to prevent. We'd also like to clarify a few points about licensing. Now, there's no question that licensing forecloses critical uses because, as has been discussed, nearly every license involves a non-disparagement clause that expressly prevents the sort of film criticism um, and social criticism that's, uh, that fair use really uh, allows and that it is designed to allow under the First Amendment. But we would also like to li mention that even for non-critical uses, one license isn't enough. If one, if one rights holder, holder grants a license, that won't necessarily prevent others from bringing suit under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. In fact, most licenses contain standard clauses that in some instances state that the license isn't complete, and in other instances require the licensee to obtain permission from all others who might claim rights to the material. That's the sort of problem that Ms. Foster has encountered. This makes clear that the burden that licensing would impose for even non-critical uses would impose a substantial adverse effect, and that's why an exemption is needed. And that's the point. Congress created this rulemaking in order to prevent requiring licensing for fair use. Finally, this exemption won't lead to any piracy or any other sorts of harm. That's the final point that we want to make and emphasize, and it's the point that's Ultimately, in the face of the adverse effect that our filmmakers and authors are suffering, uh, it's the point that shows that this exemption absolutely should be granted. Nobody has alleged any piracy flowing from the previous exemptions. 
or even any current perception of piracy or confusion. That's because the previously granted exemption, like the ones proposed today, cover a clearly defined group of responsible creators who themselves rely on copyrights and digital protection for their own works. That's why there's no basis to even speculate that harm would flow from, the, from these two exemptions. For the reasons that we've discussed and uh, others have discussed, proposed classes 7D and 7E are perfect examples of the sort of non-infringing uses that Congress intended to grant exemptions for. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, just one last quick point in case I wasn't clear before. Um, when, uh, when filmmakers do call Jim and, and ask for his help because there are very few Jims out there uh, in the filmmaking community, the, the ultimate answer that they, that they come to is, is they, they just can't do it. Either for it's too complicated, it's too expensive, they don't even know if it's going to meet the standards. So I don't want to take away the thunder from that last statement, but I just want to make very clear um, that the answer is that filmmakers aren't using it even when they are able to talk to Jim because it just can't meet their needs and, and it can't meet the distributors' uh, requirements. So thank you very much. for that are, are as follows. One, for the filmmakers, we really haven't seen identified ACS protective works that are unavailable for non-infringing use of uses. Um, for example, uh, one of the witnesses testified that there were films available only in BD, protected by ACS, that were not available in DVD, and we've just really not been able to find that except for certain, a very small set of directors bonus material, but to our knowledge, because as we testified that media is still an emerging format of the dominant format is DVD, that film titles that are available on DVD are also available on, on DVD, for which the circumvention uh, exemption for documentary filmmakers exists. And uh, bidders and ebook creators do not specify ACS technology in the proposed classes, and therefore should, uh, we, we, we have just are confirming that they are not um, seeking an exemption to circumvent the ACS in this um, rulemaking proceeding. So for the documentary filmmakers as well as the um, fictional filmmakers, there are alternatives. For the documentary filmmakers, there is the use of the work on DVD. Um, it was stated that, that for broadcasting purposes now, the standard definition um, does not work for uh, for uh, documentary filmmakers. But in our looking at the PBS website, it says that uh, PBS will accept video that is acquired in standard definition and up converted to Sony HD cam video format for submission. And it may well be for documentary filmmakers that clips that they seek to use are not available in high definition. Um, Zabruder footage from Kennedy assassination that I've seen in many documentary films simply isn't available in high definition. So I don't believe that public television stations are going to ban documentaries and not broadcast them that include that particular footage simply because it's not in high definition. And for documentary filmmakers who have the wherewithal to be obtaining ENO insurance and the like in producing films for, for broadcasts on PBS. We believe this up conversion uh, capability is, is not beyond their reach. Um, but the other thing we wanted to demonstrate 
in particular for documentary filmmakers and for uh, fictional filmmakers is the fact that unlike from the panel this morning, they typically have access to them, uh, they typically have access to very, very high quality cameras um, because they use those cameras to shoot their films. And so David was going to just uh, display a clip that was made from shooting uh, with a camera. Uh, it's a Panasonic HP X2000. The uh, manufacturer suggests a retail price is $28,000. Uh, they're available on eBay for between $10,000 and $12,000. And so here, here's a clip that was made using a camera um, taking the uh, recording from a, was it a computer screen? Mm -hmm. The point here is that video capture software, which we were speaking about this morning, which costs under $50 or $40 and seems to be an acceptable tool, we, we would contend. Or for educators, we wouldn't expect educators to have these high-end cameras. If you're a fictional filmmaker or a documentary filmmaker, of course, you're going to be making your product with a high-end camera, particularly if it has to be in high definition to meet broadcast standards. And so we believe this is a perfectly reasonable alternative to use a camera of high quality to capture and, if you will, camcord uh, off, off the screen in order to be able to use the clips. Um, and then we talked about uh, clip licensing a little bit. Um, we believe that, and, and since my regular job is really for a studio, that, that the studios have really gone, uh, made, made incredible progress in making the clip licensing process easier. Um, Universal has an online site. We have testimony from the 17th that Warner Brothers regularly responds to the first requests within 48 hours. Um, we appreciate the fact that in terms of uses that may be considered very critical and disparaging, that often the clip licenses do have those provisions, so we acknowledge that the licensing isn't the answer for every single use that a documentary or fictional film maker might seek to make. But we believe it shouldn't be dismissed out of hand as, as not a, um, a viable alternative. Um, and finally, we wanted to and so I, we were just displaying some of the, 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 the screenshots from uh, Universal's online clip licensing service. Um, for documentary filmmakers, we wanted to display this, this little bit about from a documentary filmmaker named Aaron Brannon and his experience with working with the United States National Film Archives, where a filmmaker can go in and access the, the work that is in the archives and create a very good copy by using audio and video cables, um, which is permitted by, by the archives. Again, another, another alternative for, for that. And finally, in terms of discussing the documentary filmmakers and the, the, the need for the, the highest quality material, we, we were looking at um, some of the submissions from Tamsin Ravrilati who did the documentary film Bigger, Stronger, Faster, and wrote a very interesting piece about fair use and trying to get the, the, the outlines of fair use. And was talking about that as well as the access to materials. And what she said is that they ended up mastering from a whole variety of materials, things like old VHS recordings of TV shows, low res on, online, online downloads for which no master existed. So we believe it's typical for documentary filmmakers to access many, many different sources of materials of various qualities in order to um, uh, 
uh, uh, put together a final product. It was interesting, she said also in a few cases, we actually decided to pay for the license of clips for which we knew we could employ fair use simply to get the high quality master. So sometimes clip licensing isn't necessarily about the permissions, it can be about getting access to the underlying master material because studios, when they grant licenses, work with the filmmakers to try and deliver the content in the format that's going to be the most useful for them. Just wanted to, to sort of comment on a couple of the comments that I can see that Brandon made um, or, 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 or one, of, one of the other witnesses. We shouldn't confuse the fair use and the, and the access controls measures because, for example, if you are given a no objection letter and that letter says, you may need to get rights from the musicians involved or the talent involved or other parties involved. We as a studio are simply saying that we're not objecting to your use. The fact that there may be talent rights involved has nothing to do with access control measures. It simply has to do with fair use rights, it, fair use rights and fair uses. So if you have fair use and you're confident that your use is a fair use, then you wouldn't need to seek the underlying talent uh, consents because you would be relying on your fair use defense. So to say that that permission somehow negates the, the, the fact that, that, that a letter, a no objection letter somehow negates its value because it may say that you need to go seek other permissions really doesn't, doesn't seem to hold water to me because if it's fair use, it's fair use, so you don't have to go seek other permissions. And so I think it's important not to confuse rights, permissions, fair uses with the notion of whether you actually need to have an exemption to circumvent technical protection measures in order to make the fair uses. And I think there's been a little bit of a mashup of that um, um, in the earlier testimony. And now that I made that detour, let me just go back to this. Um, so it's, it's common practice for filmmakers to go to various sources with varying degrees of quality to um, obtain their clips. As I mentioned, clip licensing is available and the issue is not necessarily the legal requirement or, or lack thereof, but rather simply as a mechanism to access the source and the format. Um, technical protection measures like AACS actually facilitate non-infringing uses because it is those technical protection measures that have made the content owners comfortable to release the content out into the market in the first place, where then documentary filmmakers or other filmmakers can take advantage of copying that in, in ways that don't involve <coughs> circumvention. And in fact, we think this will actually make it less likely that filmmakers will have to rely on the studios to provide access to the underlying source materials. And uh, I just wanted to just briefly talk about, you know, again, the value of technical protection measures to the, the, the studios and the filmmakers um, for AACS as well as for DVD, uh, CSS for DVD. We use those measures in order to, to um, facilitate our sale of content through the home entertainment market. It's a market that is in decline overall, even including BD um, and new digital distribution models. That's what that uh, last slide showed. Um, and from this slide, what you can see is that uh, although the overall market is declining, BD is a bright spot. BD is the little blue bar there, and it is increasing. And therefore, it's one of the bright spots, and we think it deserves particular caution um, before granting uh, any sort of exemptions to the protection measures that protect BD. And finally, this slide is showing based on third, third party uh, studies about where we are today in the BD, BD market, the adoption of Blu-ray players being at around 40 million households and expected to rise to at least 64 million households in 2015. And uh, here again is showing year by year on a quarterly basis the growth, the positive growth in BD, which is in excess of 20%. And therefore, uh, you know, we believe that 
that that augurs for caution in granting um, uh, exemptions. That's it. Thank you. Bruce, you ready? Association, um, as we say, is yes, we're the same organization uh, this afternoon as we were this morning. Um, and I want to make a few points uh, in relation to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, first, um, to clarify, DVD CCA does not object to the renewal of the uh, uh, documentary film exemption. Um, DVD CCA does exempt, object to the creation of new exemptions for fictional filmmakers <coughs> or ebook creators. Um, the, here, um, our distinction uh, is, is made in, in part on the likelihood that a use is fair use in the broad categories that have been described, um, where, we, where we think that it's much more likely that in a documentary film that the use is fair use. In a fictional film, um, we're not as, at all as certain to have a broad category exemption for all fictional films um, would seem to invite uh, the possibility that the, the uses uh, of the exemption would not, in fact, be fair use. And um, we don't believe that it has been demonstrated here that a uh, sufficient, uh, sufficiently high number of them would be fair use to uh, uh, warrant an exemption. Um, the same is true with ebooks. Um, there, the Experience is much less. Uh, we have much less experience because this is a, a new um, phenomenon, it's a new market. But our concern is that um, uh, we don't believe that the uh, uh, the numbers of uses uh, that have been uh, put forward in terms of the again the broad category of all multimedia ebooks um, would uh, necessarily lead to. Uh, high percentage of those uses being fair use. Uh, we also believe that uh, there are a number of uh, alternatives um, that are available. Uh, we've just seen the, uh, the high quality uh, camera shot of a, of a high, high resolution screen that would be available for um, filmmakers who have access to a uh, professional level uh, camera. Um, and to, even for those who don't have access to the, the level of camera that, that we did we didn't go buy a camera like that. We, we hired a videographer uh, for a, a relatively minor amount of money per day uh, to work with us to create that. So that's um, uh, you know not beyond the fact that you might not be able to afford a twenty or $40,000 camera doesn't mean you don't have access to it. Uh, similarly, the video capture software, there's been quite a bit of discussion during the course of the day about the, the quality of that certain purposes we understand it may not be at the quality, but for other purposes, um, it should provide the, the quality images. Uh, the ebook creators, for example, may well be able to make use of uh, video capture software, as we have, have demonstrated. That was able, again, just to reemphasize the point I made this morning, but in this context, to make the point that the, the, the replay video capture software was sufficiently high quality, was able to make an image sufficiently high quality as to make a distinction in, the, in that scene in All the President's Men. Um, so you could tell that, that two parts of the scene were, were uh, in focus and, and the in-between was not. Uh, we believe that's high enough quality for many uses, if not, uh, if not most. Um, and uh, with regard to the fictional filmmakers, again, the licensing of clips for these types of uses and standard practice immediately and provides and actually can provide the actual format which is what Dean was making that uh, she may buy a particular movie maker as opposed to taking either DVD uh, or Blu-ray and then having to modify that format um, in any event and process that format to, to become the form that the movie um, And for all of those reasons um, uh, we believe that those, those two new requests Thank you. Uh, Steve McCallum's representing the uh, seven national organizations under the, the name of the Joint Creators Copyright Office. Thank you again for structuring this 
hearing in the way that you have, because I think it's important to distinguish among the different types of uses of audio visual material that are now covered by a single significantly different and pretty distinct um, uh, cases. And uh, we think this is true both with respect to the two main, if you will, types of issues here. First, um, are the uses that are uh, intended to be made for circumvention in fact non-infringing, which is the uh, standard for this proceeding that's the proponents uh, and burden of meeting. And second, uh, whether <coughs> met, are there alternatives uh, that are available to uh, people who wish to make those non-infringing uses that don't involve circumvention. Both of those categories are present in all three of the flavors of this uh, uh, circumvention of, uh, of, uh, of TPMs for, uh, uh, for audio legal materials exemptions, uh, but I think the mix is quite different in, uh, in, in the three of them. I'll, I'll say a little bit about both of them. <laughs> both the question of alternatives and the question of whether the use is in fact non infringing. Uh, logically, I guess I should start with the, whether the use is in, in fact non infringing. And I think, it was, I think it was Alex who said it, clearly this is all fair use because there are gatekeepers involved. Uh, errors and omissions insurance has been obtained, best practices have been followed, and clearly that means everything that's done here. I think that very much overstates the case, but I do think that um, uh, productions that, that meet those criteria are certainly much more likely to be fair use than the category of, that's proposed, which simply is someone making a documentary film or a documentary filmmaking or fictional filmmaking, and they have a reasonable belief that the circumvention um, is necessary. Uh, I don't see anything in that proposal about gatekeepers or about insurance or about these other safeguards, if you will, that I think would, would substantially increase the likelihood that the uses that we're talking about are in fact not infringing. There's no guarantee and there will continue to be disputes about this, I'm sure, but I think it makes a big difference and if that's the basis on which the, this assertion is made, then it's going to have to appear, I would think, in the exemption itself. I think with respect to ebooks, I, I think that the record is probably not quite as clear on this, I'll get to that uh, uh, in a minute. But but the uh, the uh, professionals who obtain uh, errors and omissions insurance, I think probably even though there's there's only one Jim Morris said, I think there's probably other people who won't be intimidated by a 249 page manual for operating the equipment that's needed. Uh, I would be, but I'm not in that business. So I think even for the, for the professionals, I think there's a, a greater assurance that the is in fact not infringing, there's also probably <coughs> greater availability of alternatives. So let me turn to, uh, to alternatives. Um, I think the case for alternatives here really depends on another set of gatekeepers. We're told <coughs> again that PBS requires everything to be in high definition, won't accept up conversion, um, and, uh, and therefore, uh, in order for people to make these uses, I think I would just encourage the office to probe that a bit. I think it, it as we've already stated, if it were the case that, that uh, anything that isn't done in HD, it isn't uh, native HD, we're banned from America's airwaves, we would be losing a great deal of our national heritage. We would be losing a lot of Gordon Quinn's films that he's made over the years. I don't think it's quite that black and white, if you will, or it's not quite that clear uh, that how, how, in other words, how, how tightly the gate is, 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 being, is being monitored here. Even if it were, I would then just call your attention to the legislative history of the provision that you are applying here. And if you look on uh, page 639 of the House Manager's Report, page 6 of the Copyright uh, Society Blueprint, uh, and it, it tells you that adverse impacts on non infringing uses that flow from other sources, including marketplace trends, other technological or changes in the roles of libraries, distributors, or other intermediaries are outside the scope of the rulemaking. Uh, so in terms, uh, this is the legislative history of the provision you're, you're expected to apply here, you're required to apply here. 
So I think that has to be taken into account in evaluating whether the, the, the uh, distribution, the intermediary gatekeepers, the networks and so forth, uh, are really uh, rigorously without exception requiring HD to the extent that would, would uh, justify the exception that's sought. I think to the extent that that's not, I mean, this particularly turns on the Blu-ray question, but it also goes to the question of uh, streaming video. Uh, and uh, I think if you look at the, at the chart that Dean just showed, DVD is still very much with us. It's still three quarters of the, of the volume of, of, of the business, as, as I roughly calculated. Uh, Blu-ray is growing, but it's, it's not a lot yet. And, and as Dean pointed out, um, everything, just about everything that's available on Blu-ray is also available on DVD. So unless you are convinced that uh, the uh, proponents have met their burden of showing that they simply just can't get on television without, uh, and can't use up conversion and so forth, uh, and are just going to be entirely shut out of that, and if you reconcile that with what the legislative history says, I think those are some hurdles that have to be surmounted. Uh, finally, with respect to the, to the uh, e-books, I think the, the record is probably much less uh, well developed on that, both in terms of uh, whether there is an equivalent to the gatekeeping that Alex talked about for documentary filmmakers. Um, in other words, is there some type of assurance that uh, at least increases the likelihood that the uses will be fair in the e-book setting? I, I have no quarrel with the uses we were shown here if they were appearing in Again, this covers everybody. This would cover all the ebook producers, and that's a, a, you know, a concern that we have. Uh, and, and second, uh, in terms of the other intermediaries, I wasn't clear, and maybe I didn't fully appreciate the, uh, uh, Peter's testimony, but I don't think we have the same situation of a, uh, a well, as described by the documentarians, of a rigid gatekeeper who won't let anything non HD through. So uh, I would just encourage the uh, office to probe for those issues a little bit more. I and mean, I think that the demonstration that was shown with uh, using uh, professional equipment uh, was, was pretty impressive. I'm sure uh, Jim will, will tell us all the areas in which it falls short from his perspective, but I think it helps to show that uh, just as in the previous panel, one thing we know has changed over the last three years is that the alternatives have become more robust. Uh, the the uh, availability of the material has become greater. The licensing part of it, which I agree is not the whole answer, but it may be part of the answer, is much more available. Uh, the, the screen capture you know, and technology, uh, and editing technologies have become more robust and more able to deliver a higher quality product. So I think that has to be taken into account in comparison uh, with three years ago. But uh, in, in the final analysis, I think your decision on this really will need to turn on whether the exemption is defined clearly enough to reduce the currently very high risk that it will that a lot of these uses will not be non-infringing. And, and secondly, uh, on whether there are reasonable alternatives available that will enable the non-infringing Thank you. One question for you, Steve. I think you may have distinguished your position from that of DVD CCA, but I want to make sure I have a clear understanding. I understood Bruce correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce. Uh, DVD CCA, in any event, is okay with the existing exemption for documentary filmmakers. I think I heard the opposite from you. Is that yeah, that, that, yeah, that is not our position. Uh, uh, again, it, it's, it's, you have to determine whether they've met the burden based on the evidence that's presented this time um, uh, to, to, meet, uh, to, meet that, uh, to meet that standard. I think it, um, if they are to be, if there is an area in which, uh, 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 let me put it this way, it seems to be more likely that that burden can be met if the exemption is narrowed significantly to incorporate the kinds of gatekeeping safeguards that the proponents themselves are, are, are repeatedly talking about. And that, I'm sure the proponents sitting at this table uh, abide by. But our position is in opposition to renewal of the exemption. Uh, and maybe this is cutting it a little too finely, but is your position <coughs> that they haven't met their burden, or is your position that, in fact, 
there is no need for a citizen exception. You, 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 may well, not, you may not, I don't they know. haven't met their burden of showing that there is a need because yeah. they have to show that it, it's, that you start in fact on a bringing that there, there are no alternatives, I think, on, on both counts. There, there's, I, I will give you folks an opportunity to say anything in direct response to what you've heard from these folks, but on the last point Steve made, which is with respect to the documentary filmmaking exemption that is now in place, I'd like your reaction to the notion of building in some additional protections, perhaps centered around the gatekeepers that you've spoken about, for example. Is that workable, desirable, totally unworkable, totally undesirable? What, what's your reaction to that? You, you asked that, this is Michael Donaldson. Yeah. Uh, you asked that question uh, last time with regard to insurance, mm -hmm. and I sort of could tell you were wanting to enrich the uh, definition of the restriction. I'm just wanting to get an answer to my question. The, that's all I want. <laughs> the, uh, the insurance clearly won't work. It just comes way too late. And I'll be darned if I could think of anything in the documentary field that would would work or is needed because uh, <coughs> the uh, the exemption has helped literally hundreds of filmmakers make films that are impact more impactful get the message across better without any adverse impacts no piracy no expansion so I I, I did struggle because I, I, I sense your desire there but I, I don't see any any way to change that rule that would help anybody do anything except just uh, perhaps discourage a couple of uses. Steve, what about that point that the E&O is sort of one of the last steps, so by, by the time you get to the E&O carrier, the circumvention is already taking place. That's, that's true, but let's, let's, <clears throat> let's look at this realistically. I mean, uh, again, what we're trying to, uh, what I think the proponent is trying to avoid here is the risk of a lawsuit from a copyright owner or uh, uh, anybody else who's standing under Section 1203. Uh, Against the circumvention. I mean, because again, it's it, you know fair use. There's going to be disputes about fair use, but that's a separate uh, a separate issue. I think it's extremely unlikely that those suits would be brought uh, before the. Uh, in in most cases, the potential plaintiff wouldn't even be aware of the circumvention having taken place until the documentary is released. By the time the documentary is released, there either is insurance or there isn't insurance. And if the, uh, the, uh, the producer has decided to go naked and not, not take on insurance, then perhaps that's a factor that should be taken into account in deciding whether, uh, you know, then this would be a lawsuit. Let's remember, this is not a, uh, a copyright infringement lawsuit. It doesn't have the, even the remedies of copyright infringement. Right? So $2,500 statutory damages. I mean, obviously, if it's an extremely successful uh, documentary that makes millions of dollars and material involved is, you know, a very large part of the film and perhaps there's potentially large damages there, but I think, let's not confuse this with a, a copyright infringement case, but I, I think in, in, as a matter of practice, I don't think it's, in, I don't think it will be impractical because I don't think these claims are likely to, uh, to arise except in cases where a, a film is actually distributed. I, I get your point as a practical matter, but yet in, in trying to craft an exemption, I guess what you'd be suggesting we do is come up with an exemption that is sort of conditional. Well, I mean, the conditional isn't even the right word. I'm trying to figure out how it works because the exemption is an exemption from liability for the act of circumvention, which you will engage in clearly before you've taken the step of an E&O review. You don't know at that point what the result of that E&O review is going to be. So. But you have to know what use you're going to make. In order to qualify for the exemption that's proposed, you have to know what use you're going to make of the material that's been circumvented. You have to know that you're circumventing it solely for incorporating short portions for the purpose of fair use. Right, so you're trying to you're trying to put in a requirement that you go past that gatekeeper, which is something that's going to happen at some point in the future following the circumvention. And we've certainly never done that before. It strikes me as rather odd to craft an exemption that well, what, it requires that you have a good faith intention to go to an E&O carrier? Is that it, or, or how do you do that? Well, no, again, I don't think, uh, uh, 
in, uh, we, I've heard many times from proponents that if the use turns out, the court determines that the use is not fair, the exemption would not apply. <coughs> that, again, depends on the use that's made after circumvention occurs. But that's different, of course. That, that, that's a question of law. It, it's, it's, in every case, the use has got to be non-infringing. And in some cases, maybe many cases, you're never going to know that until the end of the day. But that's a question of law. This is a question of fact. This is a factual prerequisite for your being able to exercise the exemption. And yet, that factual prerequisite is, in fact, a post-requisite. And that just strikes me as being a bit difficult to do. Well, I think it is a little different than what you've done in the past, but you have, you have all of these exemptions have conditions, <coughs> factual conditions. I mean, you have to prove that you have a reasonable belief is a factual condition. Uh, there's a lot of uh, factual matters that would, uh, you know, if you look at the other exemptions, there's a lot of factual matters that would have to be have to be proven, and they don't all, they haven't all come into fruition, I think, at the time, at the moment of circumvention. That's the point I'm making. I, I, I hear you that, that it, that, in, in theory, you would be committing an act of circumvention. It wouldn't be clear at the time whether or not you're, you're entitled to the exemption. Uh, but I think if you're in, in the business of making documentary <coughs> films, you know that if you're going to uh, uh, release it, uh, anything more than a very limited release, you're probably going to seek insurance. And, and uh, uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty foreseeable. And uh, as I said, there are other instances where uh, you don't know whether you qualify for the exemption until after you've done the circumvention. Dean, you had something? I just wanted to, I mean, this is a little bit out of my area, area of expertise, but my, my understanding is that, you know, when seeking errors and emissions insurance, it's not just about reviewing the film once it's in the can and once it's finalized. It's a process, it's an ongoing process that can involve review when it's still just a script and there hasn't been shooting that's begun, and in fact, um, in Tamsin Rawati's whole uh, uh, article that she writes about um, getting actually fair use advice, she talks about how you need to be consulting with the lawyers as you're in the process of making the film, not when the film is finished, because uh, like Mr. Donaldson, he will review potential uses of clips before they're actually put into the film to say, I think this one qualifies as fair use, I think that one doesn't, or you may need to do more commentary. So the notion that these gatekeeping functions, whether it's legal review or it's an emissions insurance, happens all post facto, I just don't think is accurate. And Michael, can you get your reaction to that? Uh, on, a, on a couple levels. Uh, first of all, to respond to, to Steve's point about the timing of lawsuits, um, last Sundance Film Festival, we had 19 films that we worked on, <coughs> mostly documentaries, but some shorts and some fictional films. We had two cease and desist letters prior to the first screening at Sundance. One of them was Mr. Thrush's film from This American Life. They mistakenly thought from the publicity that his film was based on one of their episodes. So I did jump in. Uh, I didn't have two nickels to rub together, so I just did it, you know, to, to get him out of that so he could stay on his way to, to Sundance. Um, and the other one was um, uh, The Queen of Versailles, that where the, uh, the subject of the film uh, ended up not liking the description of it being a rags to riches to rags story, even though it, it was came out of his mouth. Um, and he actually ended up filing a lawsuit before it ever showed publicly, or he saw it, or any representatives of him saw it, just based on the publicity. So the, the sequencing of, of when you find out you have a problem is different. Now, in the case of Queen of Versailles, we had insurance. With the case of uh, Mr. Thrush, uh, he didn't then, doesn't now, and you know, the, I, I don't know if he'll ever <laughs> get insurance, not because he couldn't if he could afford it, but uh, that film, black and white, no professional actors, it'll have some distribution, but it will not have much in the way of monetization, to use it a common one. To go more to what Dean was saying um, about this, this article, we might as uh, well out it here. That, that this was a film I worked on, and the article um, did talk about our early involvement uh, uh, working with filmmakers so they understand fair use, and we apply it fairly rigorously. We also apply 
other laws we know about fairly rigorously. This was before the DMC exemption. So we, we were telling our filmmakers, you can't rip a DVD. And if you look at that article, uh, the head of the paragraph, uh, that, that all the quotes he came from, uh, the head of the paragraph said, the downside of fair use, uh, which was that you have to go find a good source. And uh, the author of the, the producer of the film, author of the article, goes on to describe all those things as things they had to do because we wouldn't let them rip the DVD. That was before the exemption. Uh, this is a classic case of why the exemption is needed for, for documentary films. And in fact, this did end up, this film did end up um, running into some resistance with, and, and it's been too long, so I can't dredge out of my memory who it was, but I remember being on the phone with some techie who did not want to accept the film because of the de degraded uh, clips were too numerous because they couldn't rip DVDs pre the exemption. Yeah, and I would also hold, on, hold on, I, I still have got the answer. I need that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, maybe I forgot the question. What? So, um, let's say typically, yes, uh, when you're making a documentary film, yes. which is destined ultimately to go to an ENO carrier, yes, you typically just not engage in any legal review whatsoever until the film is done, and then you send it off to the carrier. Or is there some kind of review done pre-filming, pre-putting together yeah. during the process, and so on? As the article says, ideally, we like to get in early and and at the concept stage and and educate the filmmaker for his or her particular film, what'll help, what won't help. Very often, I mean, our busiest month is December because that's when Sundance announces their, and we get a flood of people who have no attorney, hadn't thought about it, but Sundance tells them they better have their clearances in order and they, they come in. Nobody in our office takes a Christmas vacation. We're just crushed with work of, of unprepared filmmakers uh, who made their films out of, you know, credit cards and family and friends and didn't have a spare nickel for attorneys and we're busy clearing. So it happens both ways. Uh, films like this film is not yet rated. We were in a year early because an uh, independent film channel that was paying for it was worried at the commissioning stage. They wouldn't commission the film until they knew I was a board because they were worried about the reaction of the MPAA. Um, but that doesn't usually happen. It, it, it happened in the film that this particular article was about that, that Dean was reading from. I wish it happened more often, but we, I would say, I would say today with this kind of work being better known, it breaks um, not quite 50-50 yet. I'd say 60% of the films come in pretty late in the game. Jackie, you have something you want to add on that point? Yeah, two, uh, two things, um, and, then, and then Gordon has a, something to say about yeah, this. Yeah, well. just briefly about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the quote that Dean put up on the screen actually proves our point. The point was we couldn't make fair use because we couldn't get the high quality material. We had to go and seek permission and pay for permission for something that we had every right to use, and that should that should be noted. Uh, the other issue is that if you required ENO, and I think this Gordon can speak to this more, if you required ENO at the outset, what you'd end up doing is pricing out a lot of filmmakers who can't afford that until the, until the end stage, or who decide they, they are making fair use, and thousands of filmmakers do that regularly. They make fair use and they go for it and it's not a problem. Many get E&O. We have training that, that, that permeates throughout the community and other resources, and Alex is going to make the point too, uh, that, that it's not just E&O, it's also the statement of best practices and fair use which many filmmakers have. Jordan? Let, let me, oh, sorry, just, um, I'm gonna come back to this point that you guys were talking about, but I, since you're talking about that now, I wanna pick up on that. This whole uh, year of e &O insurance and um, gatekeepers, like PBS and that kind of thing. And for some of us, that is our outlet, and we work with those people. But I'm here speaking for the entire class of documentary filmmakers, and a bit of history, 
For 20 years, approximately, we lost the right to use fair use because of the aggressive tactics of the people that you represent. They wrote cease and desist letters, they threatened everybody, they never sued because they didn't have a case. But the gatekeepers would not accept it. When we first published the statement of best practice and fair use for documentary filmmakers, we spent years speaking to people, to teachers in schools, to broadcasters, and to e and insurance, and to lawyers, to re-educate everybody in the field about what the law really said. And we finally got some traction, and finally PBS was the first they came in and they said, okay, we will accept it, and we went on PBS, we didn't have e and insurance. Now we've come even farther. But what's important and what I think we're facing now is a situation in which if you are concerned, we've had no cases in the last three years of abuse, but if you are concerned that there are filmmakers out there who are going to be making uses that are not fair use, then go after them for that. The problem with the, with the way that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act constrains us is that the mere act of acquiring something for a legal use has been made illegal. And so you never get to test the question of what, without this exemption, we never get to, for the courts to test the question of what I did, is it fair use or not fair use? Steve is right, we can have e and insurance, we can have PBS and we can still be sued. We understand that. And when I speak about it, I make people understand that you are asserting a right. But if we can't get that test into the courts, we're screwed if you're actually able to be able to enforce the DMCA. So I just wanted to get that out there, that there are many, many kinds of documentaries. There are all kinds of new markets now and ways that people are distributing. We have to distribute a lot of our work in broadcast and theatrical and we do work with the NO insurance, and we do work with PBS, and that's important. I want to come back to this thing, though, about when do lawyers get involved. And everything, I agree with everything that Michael said. But I want to be clear. Different filmmakers work with lawyers and make different decisions about at what point you need to get the lawyer involved to give you the letter that you need to get your you know, insurance. If I was doing something like this film is not yet rated, and Michael knows there have been projects that I've talked to him about before we even started. I want to get some idea of what, you know, how would this look? But there are many, many films, and, and the two examples that I mentioned, uh, A Good Man uh, and um, The Interrupters, it's kind of classic fair use. I'm a filmmaker with a great deal of knowledge about this. So I actually go and get my letter uh, from the lawyer really near the end of the process. We're in fine cut, we delivered it to PBS and we're looking to get the insurance. Because I feel that I know it quite well. There are other filmmakers and sometimes when I talk to people and they talk to me and they're saying, well what about this, what about that? I said, you need to start talking a lot to a lawyer earlier in the process. So both, you know, we do both kinds of things. It's a, it's a relationship between two kinds of professionals that people define in their own way. And I think that anything that, you know, kind of predefines when we have to do that would be a, a barrier. And I certainly think, you know, that we do not need, you know, more stringent kind of gatekeeping. That's not the problem. The gatekeeping gives them some security, and I'm happy about that, and we mentioned that, that we're not, you know, going beyond fair use. But if you have problems with fair use, make that your issue. Don't make the issue that somebody rip the DVD if what they're doing, you know, make that the issue, take them to court for that, not for something else. And that's why we need this exemption. So that when there are test cases, when we do get into the courts, we're going to get into the courts discussing the proper thing. I don't think you'll find that there have been any cases in which uh, documentary filmmakers have been sued for violating 1201A1. Have there been? I don't think no, that's our point. Right. What I think I'm hearing loud and clear from this side of the room, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that it would be unacceptable to impose any requirement in order to get the advantage of the exemption. That you get e &O insurance or that you run it by a lawyer. Good idea to do it, but you, you would resist having that as part of a exemption, correct? Co correct. Okay, That's then. exactly right. how I would put it. And, and you're absolutely right. I would say to people, get e and insurance, 
get a lawyer involved, but it should not be a requirement. Okay, a good deal of what we've been hearing from you folks in LA and here is how we shouldn't be concerned because there's E&O insurance and there's this legal review. Shouldn't we ignore all of that because you basically just told us you can't rely on that and you don't want to be bound by that? Why is that relevant to we're, anything we're thinking about? What, what we are talking, okay, that's a good point. What we are talking about here is a continuum. We're talking about a process. And so, for instance, they were making the point that there is very little material right now that is out on Blu-ray that is not available in standard DVD, you know? Well, if I'm a filmmaker, and the piece of material that I need is an, on an extra on a Blu-ray DVD to make my point. That's the piece I need. We're talking about a right. We're talking about freedom of expression. And so it's in the same way, it's like I can't tell you what the needs are of every filmmaker in my class. What I can tell you is, is that we as a class have tried to be very responsible with this exemption and to make sure that it's not being abused. That we are saying, don't confuse locking something up with fair use. Fair use is what we're asserting. That's the right that we need to be able to use. And we need this exemption to be able to use it. So it is true, we bring up you know, insurance, we bring up, and it's not the only thing we base our argument on, but we bring it up because we do understand that for most high visibility documentaries in most cases in which they're looking at, that's the reality of the situation. But I'm sure that there are exceptions, that there are films that are out there that are absolutely important and have audiences and are playing a role in a range of information in our democratic society that do not have those two requirements met that are using it with absolutely solid, legitimate fair use. Right. So that's why we're saying we'd be a problem. We're running out of time, and we've just been talking about one little tiny topic. If you feel compelled to something, you've got one minute. Alex is going to make a quick point. Okay, so the one, just to follow up on what Gordon said, we don't want the uh, understanding to be that it's e it's all about ENO, and we we have presented evidence about the prevalence of ENO practices, the frequent requirement of ENO practices as one piece or one factor that will push documentary and fictional filmmakers, any book authors, over the threshold of likely to be non-infringing. But this is part of a larger community with many other factors that also put us over that threshold, including the use of doc a statement of best practices, including the use of uh, being rights holders in their own regard, and therefore you know, more likely to be responsible. And we don't feel that E&O is, is it's an all or nothing. It's an important factor, but it's not the decisive factor for determining it. And then Brendan's going to do one if, quick if, thing. If I may respond to the point that was made about licensing earlier, we're not saying that talent rights and other contractual rights are the issue here. Under, under 1203A, anybody who has a right protected under Title 17 can sue for a violation or an alleged violation of 1201A1A. Um, that means it's very hard and a great burden for filmmakers and authors to avoid DMCA liability by licensing. Even if the studios that are represented here today grant a license, they still have to go after go and get licenses from all of the other uh, individuals who might have been involved in the film and whose rights may be included in the film, such as composers or, or uh, people whose recordings are used, etc. cetera. Um, and also, if a filmmaker or author signs a license uh, with the studios, for example, that license will often obligate them to seek all of these myriad permissions, which is you know, furthering that burden. And in response to the legislative history that the opponents cited, um, about a page before uh, the, the language that was quoted, um, there's a very uh, telling um, uh, section that, uh, that Congress put in there. Uh, the point is that the harm here is not flowing, uh, that the harm here is flowing from the implementation of a technological protection measure. And in order to measure that harm, we have to look at the facts that are confronted by fair users, in this case, like filmmakers and authors. And so what Congress said was, the committee is concerned that marketplace realities may someday, may someday result in less access rather than more to copyrighted materials that are important to education, scholarship, and other socially vital endeavors. The result could flow from a confluence of factors, including the elimination of printer or other hard copy versions, the permanent encryption of electronic copies, etc. And they created this rulemaking as a, and this is the term they used, a fail-safe mechanism to prevent that sort of harm. 
that's I, I respect uh, your your uh, your time and so on there. May, may From this point on. on, the standing rule is keep it short and say it only if you need to say it because we're running out of time. And Steve's got a lot of questions he hasn't been able okay. to start asking. This is a real <laughs> quick. It's just to that standard that that um, Brenda just quoted, which is about the less access to copyrighted materials. I don't think we have seen one shred of evidence that technical protection measures have led to less access to copyrighted materials. In fact, there's been a plethora of growth of copyrighted materials released into the marketplace precisely because of the existence of technical protection measures that give the copyright owners the security to release this stuff into the marketplace. Jack? I have a very short response, which is that I would ask you to read our pleadings, which discuss many instances where filmmakers could not access materials because of the I think Dean and you were probably speaking about two different things, but okay, Steve. Um, to Peter, apparently, uh, and uh, I suppose too, is I'm looking for a better idea of what an ebook is. You were mentioning um, the standards, uh, ebook standards, and associating with web standards. That that's concerning to me. Um, is it everything? Is is it very defined? Can you help me with this? And kind of, I'm coming from something. Um, stated in an earlier hearing uh, when someone said, well, if we don't have the this exemption, we're going to probably look towards another one. In that case, it was documentary. We're not going to go back to the ENO right now. But some sense of defining that. If it's not you ENO know, insurance or some, it, it needs to be something, I think, that we're, there's a strong, there's a compelling reason to think there needs to be something to further define these terms, be it documentary and ebook. But for ebooks, to you both. Yeah, just to address the uh, specification issue, um, but your presumption is, is exactly right. The um, IDPF EPUB specification um, is uh, often informally referred to as a website in a box, but what it really is is a set of constraints on HTML and display, CSS, text dating style sheet, that limit what an author can do to produce a valid ebook. And so in the new standard of an EPUB 3, um, EPUB 3 embraces HTML5, which is a newer version of HTML, which is embedded in the browsers you use on your desktop, if you use a fairly contemporary browser. Um, and HTML5 inherently supports greater interactivity, <coughs> greater support for embedded video and audio and other media. And EPUB 3 is a specification that determines which of those web behaviors are considered legitimate in the publication. From this point on, IDBF considers EPUB 3 to be evolving with web standards in the sense that there will be a defined set of allowable behaviors. From the publisher's perspective, um, as well as the author and reader's perspective, it's desirable to know what you have. So just Gate open means that books get created that might not be able to be read widely. So there's an interest in defining what an ebook can encapsulate. Right. Can we make one just quick point? I'd rather, we are tight on time. I want to I put this specifically to my bed, who's obviously an author of an ebook coming up, so please tell me. Okay, I'd like to be an author of an ebook. You see that. I saw that. <laughs> coming up. Who would be uh, optimistic for? Uh, you know, <laughs> My godfather lecture alone is about five, six hours, much sought after all over the world. What I would like to do is be able to show the salient points. And the one thing I want to say is that Jack Lerner and the International Documentary Association have done an excellent job of educating the documentary community and anyone who wants to use fair use with four specific guidelines. And so I would use the discipline of that in selecting the clips, precise clips, that I need to illustrate key points. As much as I'd like to show the five-hour lecture, and many people would like me to do that, I'm only asking to do an ebook with fair use. So, to, so also just to clarify, I know Peter talked talk more generally about kind of what is going on in the larger world of things that could be called ebook publishing or multimedia ebook publishing. Um, I just want to direct you on uh, page three of our uh, initial comment uh, for the comment of Mark Berger at all. Uh, we have a discussion of, I think, what you're trying to get at. Uh, Mr. Rui, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your That's name. Right. And it reads um, electronic books or ebooks or digital files 
uh, capable of displaying written words on an electronic reader or e-reader, generally without internet access. And so we, we you know, in, in the examples we've given, these are people who are trying to take video clips um, and put them into a device that can display the video offline, uh, which is very, you know, very distinct from kind of the general concept of a website. Even though, even though there might be standards out there that would be, uh, you know, in general, our concept that we've been advocating for in our comment is a narrower subset of that. The, the difference really is that the underlying technology may have come from the web, but an ebook is a discrete and very specific type of format that is not the web. Yeah, and can I get your gift of that? So, in, in fact, um, the way an EPUB is packaged and distributed is actually as a zip file. So, the, uh, what is the, um, the display of an ebook that you would see on an e reader or on a computer uh, essentially uses HTML rendering technology, but it, the presumption is that it's a packaged portable digital file um, that, that has to be downloaded or moved and, and consumable um, portable. Uh, sounds like a podcast. It sounds extremely broad <laughs> as a definition. Um, I think I was putting forward is if you have any narrowing principles, it might be helpful to give us an idea. If it's not, if that's just what it is. Uh, no, I mean, I, again, I think the EPUB 3 specification is um, not asking you to take a look at it, but it's very specific and very detailed as to what is a permitted. Um, permitted type of behavior in any book um, and, and what is constrained. So, you know, if it helps, for example, um, one advance of EPUB 3 over EPUB is simply to support CJK balance. Just to <coughs> briefly go back to a uh, um, point that we talked about at length with regard to documentary, is there any other gatekeeper role that you would be able to point to that does narrow this concept of an e book? Can I put this to anyone who knows? We would be amenable to narrowing the definition to include specific uh, ebook formats that are in existence today, such as EPUB um, and others that we could um, you know, provide um, in, in later correspondence. Anything about um, gatekeeper role that's been mentioned for ebooks? I know we I'm trying to get back to that for documentary, but if you have anything to add in regard to the Well, we will. The type of nonfiction ebook authors that we're talking about would use a lot of the same mechanisms to make sure that they're making legitimate fair use. E and O uh, uh, insurance companies do offer E and O insurance. Uh, the document the filmmaker statement of best practices and fair use applies in the ego context very well. You can apply that to Bob Ed's work and and come out with a very rigorous product. But so I that's just, one. Can I just ask whether that was a clarification of the class that is intended to be nonfiction? Uh, it was not. I was just giving an example. Um, back to documentary films. Can you tell me more specific, uh, more specifics about the requirements for uh, distribution outlets? I talked about it in the, the notion that the um, upconverted content is a threshold, is a requirement, or you can't have too much of it. What are the specifics? Jim, want to take it? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. I'll just say one. Yeah, thing. I'll just read two paragraphs from the latest PDS technical specifications, which came out in March. Um, one of them I showed in my PowerPoint, which talks about um, artifacting associated with scan conversion. Um, but there's also one where it says, it talks about in the case of archival content where no better copies are available that the image still has to be free of, com of composite video, i.e. analog artifacts. So PDS is not the Gestapo. I mean, they do recognize that there are older pieces of source material that are necessary to put in the documentary. But what they're saying is that the, you can't just throw everything together at YouTube quality and then upconvert it at the end. You specifically forbid that. Is that in our record? Has that been submitted in the record? The, those oh, I can't. I mean, we can. It hasn't, it hasn't been, been that far. Just That's the question. Yeah, we're more than happy to provide yeah. that if you guys I, I think this is on now. Just to give you some perspective, uh, it's like, yes, the first 25 years of my work are on film. When you go back to film and you digitize it into high def, 
when you scan it, you are in high def. It's a very high quality image. And so working with PBS, the reality is, yes, if you get the Zabruder film or something like that, they are practical people. But what has been happening, and this is what I've been understanding from Jim, is they're looking at, they're looking more and more for the overall look and feel of the thing to meet their standards. So the kinds of things that right now I have a sense, and you know, regulations change, but the sense that I have right now, if it, you have something, like an image from a contemporary film, and you're making a, a point about what goes on in the culture, and that's a low quality image, that's not gonna be acceptable to them. In other words, if, if they're looking at it and they're saying, hey, come on guys, this is ridiculous, why don't you give us the quality of image that the rest of your presentation has, that's the kind of thing that they would play. If I'm using the Zabruder film, if I'm using something else in which common sense would tell you, uh, like in A Good Man, we had some old up-res VHS, you know, in, from like the early days when Bill T. Jones was a very young dancer, and we use that in the film. There is nothing else. We have no alternative. Uh, but if I used this piece that I described to you, where you see the sweat coming off of him in some of one of his major works at the peak of his career, they would have said, hey, come on, that's ridiculous. So I think they are practical people, and they do look at that, and it's certainly not like, you know, a bell goes off and they said, oh, well, you didn't, you didn't meet the standard, as long as we have done all these things that Jim talked about to meet the technical requirements. Just, just one quick note on that with, with the PBS requirements. They also have a provision that says it is not necessary that your submission meet these requirements for submission and initial review. So just, just confirming that for documentaries or other works that are submitted to PBS for initial review to see whether they're interested in moving forward. It's not a requirement that all those technical requirements be complied with. Yeah, that's, I think that's we're absolutely agreeing. true. They will, we're in agreement there. Right. They will review it. Uh, even though you haven't done all the uprising and everything to get it or, you know, gotten back to the original source material. And I'd just like to, to make two very quick points. One is that it was because of the current exemption that we were able to get the kind of quality necessary to pass the mustard a year ago, PBS specs from a year ago, for this clip that Gordon was, was talking about. Without the exemption, we couldn't have done it. There'd be no way to bring it in completely digital and work with it in a way that it would be passable. The second thing, just to respond very quickly to the, um, the camera, the high quality camera demonstration. Um, obviously, when you use a $10,000 camera, it's going to look better than a cell phone. However, without the original footage to compare it to, the only real way to compare it is to play a Blu-ray disc side by side on identical projectors and see the difference. My evaluation was that there was an excessive amount of overexposure and blooming on the highlights, which I don't think was in the original point. Well, to, uh, to the alternatives, um, for the e-books, um, the examples you put forward, Ms. Buster, showing juxtaposition of various films. <coughs> Can you tell me more specifically why some of these alternatives wouldn't have worked for those sorts of juxt juxt juxtapositions? Um, it seems like, for some of them, I, I get it. Um, you know, if, if the dust doesn't show up and if that's something you're making a specific point about, I can understand that. Some of the other ones felt like it seemed apparent that some alternatives would have functioned to be able to show the contrast between a mobster and a child. Well, no, because I teach at the top film schools in all the world, and we deal with the highest level of standards in all departments. So I'm talking about the seven arts of cinema. I'm talking about cinematography. Gordon Willis got the, cinem the Academy Award for the cinematography of that. You need to be able to see the highest gradation of his choices. And he effectively lit that film as if it was a neo-realism film from the Italian era. And so you have to be able to see the distinctions in color, and that's a very important point. You also have to show what the production design department did, costumes, music, and sound design in that film is exceptional. So I teach from the point of view of how does technology affect the storytelling in all departments, and how does the director, in this case he's also the writer, employ this central idea in all the departments. 
So it makes no sense to use a degraded quality. And besides, I'd be laughed out of the room because I'm dealing at the highest level in the studios and in the ivory tower of what cinema can do best. Well, you, you preface that by talking about where you teach. And, and it sounds like the point you just made is a very good point, perhaps, with respect to what we were discussing this morning. I'm not sure it's necessarily germane to the ebook issue that you brought up. Well, <clears throat> why would anyone want to buy a book with degraded quality materials? I think if that's the only thing out there, they might will. Well, they're going to get it otherwise. They're going to be pirates about it. <laughs> they're going to go to YouTube. And besides, why not? It only advances the quality of the copyright holders. It drives people to see the real film. So you're OK with it, guys? <laughs> <laughs> if I may. Ms. Buster wants to take the scholarship that she currently can provide to the top universities in the world and make that available to the people at large. And so if she's using a degraded copy, they're not going to get the same quality of analysis that she's talking about. They're not going to be able to see this lighting. They're not going to be able to see the costume design. That's the point. The degraded images won't work any better in an ebook than they would in the classroom. Yeah, and also, Bobette, would you care to talk about your ability to make use of these alternatives? Well, first of all, I find that whole process to be cumbersome beyond belief and absurd. I mean, I don't know. I could not get through that. I'd have to hire a special, a specialist beyond the caliber of someone like Jim. And I would have to raise the money to find a camera like that. And it feels like to me they're only creating extra work. I have a, a career that it takes me all over the world. I would have to be retrained in this in order to access all the materials I already have from the current exemption for an, an educator. Why would I want to do that? And besides that, say at USC, we are constantly upgrading all of our equipment. The, the, the manufacturers are giving it to us. Dolby is now reinstalling in our mixing stages, Atmos, which is an advance beyond THX. We get Abbott came to USC and put in their editing facilities to train the students in the state of, state of the art. And Pixar came to USC and said, we need someone who can actually do Abbott. Help us do it. We don't have the old equipment. We only have the latest equipment. We only go forward. Let me see. Back to Bruce. Discussing the notion of if there was not objection letter issued um, that there, the user would not be subject to um, lawsuit for 12-1 violation for other material. I think um, that was took issue with that. Uh, Brendan. Brandon. <laughs> Do you have any reaction to that? Or, or Dean? I, I think that, that was my my, uh, my my issue. And what I was saying is the studio issued a no objection letter. Um, and I think I think uh, Brandon is correct that if an actor who or a musician who also had a right in the film decided that they felt for 12 but there was some circumvention that they would have standing to, to bring a lawsuit if they, if they so chose. It's hard for me to imagine that that would really happen when the underlying copyright owner of the film had issued a non-objection letter um, to, 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 to permit the use in the context for which it was being, being made. So I think it's a pretty, uh, while I think he's correct on the law, I just think it's, it's, it's such an attenuated contingency that I don't think that's what an exemption should be based on. I would, I would refer you to pages 52 and 53 of our initial comment. We pointed out two disparagement clauses that are standard in studio contracts. But if you look on the same page, there are actually clauses that contractually obligate the filmmaker to go and get permission from these other so no objection letter that would contain this, which again is standard, or uh, or an actual license would still have these requirements. And uh, and uh, Dean, thank you for promising not to sue, but I'm a little concerned that well, others I, might not have the same. I, I can't attitude. speak to every studio's no objection letter, but I can certainly speak to Warner Brothers' no objection letter. And Warner Brothers' no objection letter does not contain just not disparagement. Yeah, and, and that's so absolutely correct. Right. Warner Brothers does not. So, uh, I, I gather we have nobody on this side of the room who can speak on behalf of everyone else. So. <laughs> <laughs> I Steve? Warner Brothers has the largest film library. It's 
it's not an inconsequential. Yes, we exclude Warner Brothers films. Please do not. Okay, I have a question about the uh, documentary filmmakers best practices that we've heard about. First of all, I'd like a reaction from this side of the room. Um, does a filmmaker who follows those best practices, is that someone who you think uh, ought to be able to go ahead and uh, use uh, what he takes following those practices in a motion picture, or do you have problems with those best practices? Uh, we, we have some problems with those best practices. If you question, uh, I, I think your question is whether that's the type of condition, if you will, yeah. that would help to narrow this uh, this exemption, and I think, I think it would. I do think, I'm not sure that everything in, best, in the best, state of best practices necessarily has been done at the time that the circumvention occurs, which was your objection to the idea of conditioning it on, on insurance. So it may be subject to that same objection. But I think, I think Steve's question really did it on the head, which is documentary filmmaking is not defined. And I mean, there's fictional filmmaking, neither is, I mean, I, 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 I hear that the proponents of Red attempt to the record definition of e-book, but you know, we heard this morning that, that uh, uh, the, the, the uh, video production made by a, a student in a community college class may, might qualify as a documentary film and therefore be subject to this exemption that exists now. So I think it would be helpful to sharpen this and, in, in my view, narrow this so that you uh, increase the chances that the user will be Well, that, that certainly has been a concern here. And last time around, it was a major concern. And we tried to figure out all sorts of ways to figure out who qualifies and who doesn't, and we came up with nothing. Well, as um, I recall, and I may be wrong, perhaps the IDA people can help remind me, I think we actually had agreed, the parties had agreed on one, and then the, the office decided not to recommend it. So, um, uh, my I, I, I understand you're struggling with this, and I, and I think that's appropriate. And in fact, uh, I guess you know, this might be the time to pose, if, if I could put on the record a question, that a lot of these, uh, exemptions and, and their viability will come down to drafting questions. We recognize this is not an easy problem. And I'm wondering if the office would consider treating this rulemaking more as a conventional notice of proposed rulemaking would be done under the Administrative Procedure Act and put forward to the public the uh, uh, what they plan to recommend. Looking at and the calendar, Steve, <laughs> I can tell you that as, as desirable as that might be, I can't conceive of us being able to do it in the time frame. Well, the nice thing about it is since the last rulemaking, a federal judge in New York has given us a definition of documentary filmmaking in a, one of the Borat cases. Yeah, and we also, You've got it. And we also, yeah. we also I, uh, in this comment or in the previous comment, propounded a definition that, that, um, that you're welcome to adapt if you adopt if you feel like it. But I would also point out that you didn't end up with promulgating a definition of documentary filmmaking last rulemaking, and there were absolutely zero adverse consequences to that. But we had a real effect on documentary filmmaking nationwide. Um, let me ask the side of the, the table. If we were to impose as a prerequisite for the for quali qualifying for this class, uh, that one follows the documentary filmmaker's best practices, uh, what would your reaction to that be? <coughs> Well, I, they're all looking at me because I'm one of the authors. Of course I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you get royalties? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think, I'm, go ahead. So, I mean, I, I think, again, this kind of goes back to our point. We, we don't think it's, it, that it's a silver bullet. Uh, the purpose of... Take a bronze one. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> or a brass one. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know... The, the, the best practices for documentary and fair use for documentary filming was, was meant to um, classify for, you know, quote unquote, very, as close to as clear fair use as you can get, you know, standing that it's a factual determination made by a court after the fact. It is not meant to represent the universe of fair uses. And so in this case, uh, even more so than you know, oh, I think we'd be concerned that this would be, you know, kind of limiting the definition of fair use, not by the law, but by um, what was meant to be kind of a starting point for for for, uh, for documentary filmmakers. But, but yeah, a, a, a broader test, which actually takes in every case decided since January 1, 1978, is the three question safe harbor approach you'll hear about. Uh, 
in uh, whenever it is in June up in uh, New Jersey. Uh, so there's another, there's even a better approach which will. Michael, I'm afraid that will not be in our records. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to leave the room when someone talks about it. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say to that, I, I think from our perspective, it's like I agree with everything that they said. On the other hand, that is the kind of thing. I mean, I think there, there are reasons why implementing that kind of thing can have unintended consequences. On the other hand, the reality is when we as a community, we use that document in schools and everywhere we would go with, you know, budding young documentary, Steve's a kid in class, we say, you should pay attention to this, everything is not okay, and this gives you some really clear guidelines of when you are within fair use. So, you know, I, I think it could have unintended consequences, but I don't think we would see it as, oh my God, that's a catastrophe, you know, that, that if you did something like that. I think it needs to be thought through what would the consequences be, but we do, it's exactly how we use it in reality. We're constantly pointing to it and constantly pointing to people who, you know, there's this, uh, there are people out there that think whatever you take is okay, and it's like we're saying, no, 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 we're talking about this. And that's why we publish this statement of best practice. All right, well, we're only five minutes over. Let's try to be back at 3.30 for the final panel. Um, and again, the record is closed unless we reopen it for specific questions to you. Um, so we'll, that remains to be seen. <coughs> Thank you.